Veterans in Transition is sponsored by HireVeteransFirst.com, Jelani Consulting, and Village Connector Community. Welcome to Veterans in Transition, where we promote the veteran community. Each week, we travel around the region highlighting veteran-related news issues and events. Celebrating Black History Month with the Navy's first African-American female naval flight officer, a veteran comedian who's straight out of therapy, and the VA's annual stand-down. All this and more. Recently, the VA Medical Center hosted its annual Winter Haven Homeless Veteran Stand-Down helping veterans with a holistic approach of services to address the needs. Today, the Washington, D.C. Veterans Affairs Medical Center is hosting its 25th annual Winter Haven Homeless Veterans Stand Down, where we open the doors of the medical center and welcome in the population that is experiencing transitioning from being homeless, those who are at risk for homelessness, or those who deem themselves underemployed and also may risk the opportunity of homelessness. What we're doing is um, bringing VA, HUD, as well as local, state level, um, county level governments, as well as private organizations, along with our veteran service organizations, um, to help us in this mission of averting homelessness among veterans. Back when I got out in the 80s, I got out of PDRL, Medical Retirement Chapter 61, and they weren't, it was hard for vets to get jobs, and it, was, it took me two years to get my VA claim, and if I didn't have any money saved, I'd have been probably stricken. We are an optional station where, just like others, where you can get your checklist checked, and what that would ultimately result in is you receiving text messages on your phone only of nearby available services that you need. My wife and I, uh, we took to the streets of D.C. for three nights and four days, and we tried to experience homelessness, and we learned very quickly that two things. One, the majority of people experiencing homelessness, including many, many military veterans, have a phone. And secondly, many of them, all of them in fact, are in that predicament because they did not connect to one or more services they need. So we said, let's take the single technology the majority of them have and help them connect to the services that they need. Since we've launched in the district a little over three years ago, uh, we now have about 2,000 people experiencing homelessness using our tool. And also, we're really excited that we've been able to help the many great service providers in the region connect their services to the people in need. And since we have launched, uh, we have seen overall homelessness reduce in the district for the third year in a uh, row, according to local government data. And we've also seen hypothermia deaths reduce, which D.C. government uses our tool to send out real-time hypothermia alerts uh, when there is emergency extreme weather. We have transitioning homes for the women veterans. We have 10 beds at, a, at the Riverdale house. We have some veterans at the homes now at no cost to the VA. We want to try to get veterans to get referrals and vouchers, but we don't turn anyone away. This is our second uh, event that we've participated in and we couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this event. And we're gonna be looking to hire 80,000 people across the country in the next few months. And in the DC metropolitan area, we'll be looking to hire 2,000 associates to help us with our spring season. We um, have launched our Operation Protect Veterans, part of which is alerting veterans to a lot of the top scams that are targeting them, um, sometimes involving benefits. So that is one piece of information that we think is crucial for AARP to get out there so that veterans are not uh, the victims of scams. And I come to this event last past three years. I think it's a good thing to get back to the soldiers. I really like the VA. They, okay. The doctors are great that I have, and I, I don't have any complaints. We had the privilege of speaking with World War II veteran Morris D. Craig, a Montford Port Marine who diligently served to protect our country in the 1940s during a time when the military was separated by racial divides. Me and my three friends, we were sitting around talking. Every day you got a letter before Port of Dre, and you, 
you were on pins and needles when they gonna call you. So we decided, let's all volunteer and get this over with. And that's how we all volunteered for the Marines. We all got together and we left Washington, D.C. at 6.40 p.m. to go to North Carolina. And we got in boot camp. Didn't have much problem. I didn't never have no military training because I didn't have it. Uh, never high school cadet corps. I, I would never join that. Because my father said, I ain't got no money for a uniform, so we, you don't need that. So I, I didn't have any formal military training at all. My two friends had, had you know, military training. Being out in the Washington area was something new to me. I had never been no, no far than Virginia. And all I was in Virginia, was in high school, I was on the football team and the basketball team, and we used to go to Virginia to play Virginia teams. And then Baltimore teams, that's as far as I've been was my young life. Well, we had that team before we went into the Soviet All the guys from high school had, you know, after high school had this team. When they went to war, broke, they broke up. When they came back, most of the guys went to high school with me. We formed together. And uh, we got this team, and most of us were in the Marine Corps with me. And we all got together, and we won the city's championship the first year we played. And I won the most valuable player in the league that year. The reason is because I won the most valuable player in the league because we had a system, what we call the fast break. When, you, when the ball was on the backboard, my turn was to get down the floor. And when you were free, you got the ball. I ended up scoring 20 points because the black brick. Not because I was that good. That's the system we used. We all trained at, at Mumford Point. We had a place called Head. We were chasing the place called Knox Camp. We was lower off the Mumford Point base. We were separated. So then we, we stayed there till we got trained in the 90 millimeter gun. Well, I was trained in the 30 cattle machine gun. We left North Carolina as a group, about 200. They broke it down in groups on the train to California. Well, we had a little conflict in California at the base of that because there wasn't, wasn't any Marines there, much of us was old sailors and stuff like that. And they told us, we couldn't go to the movie unless he sat in the back. That was the, 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 me and this vast group, you know, the other group hadn't come yet. So the guys just say, well, we're not going to come to the movie. Nobody's going to the movie. So they a big rock and rolled down the hill and broke the screen. And the colonel told us, take your time. Don't do anything to rest of the outfit come. But in the week, the rest of the outfit, we didn't have no problem that they saw how strong we were and how many men we had. And we didn't have oh, brooms and dustpans. We had rifles and guns. So after that, we didn't have no problem. We were trained to do for your fellow man. If your, your buddy got in trouble, you got in trouble. If your buddy got in the fight, you got in the fight. That was taught in the Marine Corps. Stick together. Then we got on the ship to, to go overseas. And we hit an island called Funi Funi in the Ellis Island. We were on the end of the island, so we stayed there until they moved us up to Marshall Island. And we stayed in the Marshall Island to the end of the war. One thing changed, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any black officers. Our, our highest rate person was a sergeant. We had white officers d during the war. We had, after the integration, we got black colonels, black lieutenants, black captains, black everything, you know. So by integrating, we got moved ahead. This wasn't an outfit that controlled by white lieutenants. We had your own lieutenants. I appreciate anybody in the service and doing what they, leaving their home 
and going in there and protect the country. I, my hat's off to them every day. I hope these young people understand what the older people went through to see what they got today and try to improve it instead of tearing it down. But they got an attitude and don't do it my way. I don't want no parts of it, which is the wrong attitude. I think it's life. He goes by the name of the Laugh Therapist, using comedy as medication for his PTSD. Veteran correspondent P.T. Bratton has this story. I am here today and I have the privilege and honor of you interviewing. Be that what? You gotta be that loud. I mean, but. But you gotta be that loud. But go I'm ahead, keep going. Go Can I'm I sorry. talk the way you I talk? You can do whatever you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a rough interview. So I'm interviewing the laugh therapist, Mr. Bernard Hines. Yes, sir. He is a Army veteran. Yes. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get from the Army to comedy? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my, my journey was, uh, was rough. Rough. I always loved comedy, but I never thought I had. I was uh, funny enough to get in front of people. So... I went, took a dare. I was going through life, uh, divorce, uh, P undiagnosed PTSD, contemplated suicide, medication here didn't work, medication didn't work, but the only thing that kept me sane was comedy. How long have you been doing comedy? I've been doing comedy professionally mm -hmm. for eight years. Wow. Eight years, and it's been a, a roller coaster. It's been times I wanted to quit, times I wanted to keep going, times I. Don't know why I'm doing this. Every time I get on stage, I am terrified, really. Anxiety, everything, because the approval. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You know, people say, man, you funny, but to yourself, you still have to get over that hurdle. But my lovely wife supports me. She gives me uh, my medication on time. <laughs> uh, and she just, she, she's my biggest supporter. So it's interesting you said the anxiety because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that usually comes with PTSD. Correct. Is anxiety. So Correct. you actually have to overcome that. Yes. For the therapy. Yes. <laughs> every time, it's crazy. Every time, I ain't gonna say every time, but 85% of the time I will book a show and I'd be like, why in the world did I do that? Because that anxiety, because you have to, even though I've been doing con for eight years, mm -hmm. you still have to prove yourself every time you get on stage. Yeah. So what, what, what things can you, do you think add or that you can take away from the army experience that kind of help you in in your new career nothing <laughs> no the thing the thing i like about comedy from the military mm -hmm. when i'm on stage can't nobody tell me nothing mm. this is my this is my area mm -hmm. nobody you can say something out there in the audience but I got the mic. Nobody's gonna like you said. Nobody's gonna hear you. They're gonna hear me. Right, right. You know because any military person, when you in the military, the military told you when you can go, mm -hmm. when you can come, how long you can stay, whether they sending you to Iraq, if mm -hmm. they're gonna send you to Afghanistan, if they want to. So every all my life, like for twenty years, I've been told when I'm gonna do something. So now you can't tell me nothing when mm. I get on the stage. So that what releases me and makes me feel like. I'm in control. Even though my anxiety is gone, mm -hmm. I'm in control of this because I know the next joke. Yeah. You don't know the next joke. I know the punchline that's going to make you laugh. Yeah. So it's like I'm in control because when you got PTSD, it seems like you are not in control of your life. Yeah. It seems like everything is controlling you, the anxiety, this on the job, we're doing active shooter training. So you, you always, you hype. Right. But up here right. is, is freedom. Give you a little background. I got three people in my head. I got Vernard, Christian, and Felix. Felix is the one to tell the jokes. They all dirty. He give them to Christian, Christian cleans them up, give them to Vernard, and Vernard give them to you, all right? <laughs> now I know somebody out there say, that boy got people in his head. I get a check for these people in my head. Some of y'all got people in y'all head probably don't get a dime, all right? So we gonna talk about me, I'm gonna talk about y'all, and check this out. I am a therapist, but I'm not licensed. I'm just medicated. All right? I'm not licensed. I'm just medicated. Thank you for bringing me up here, putting me in the MGM Grand. It was lovely, man. Everything is good. You know, by that slot machine, yeah, ha! Yes, sir. How many of y'all play lottery? How many of y'all play lottery? Be, this side don't play lottery? Must be church people. I'm a Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't play the lottery regular. I really don't. 
But when the lottery get over $250 million, my devotion come from the book of Numbers. <laughs> Why else is the book of Numbers in there? <laughs> Let me hit and bring $25 million to anybody's church. Who going to turn me away? Nobody. $25 million, you can put folks out your church you don't like. You were talking about divorce. The lawyers are good for something. Don't you say that. Because he got my child support reduced. Don't you ever say a child lawyer ain't good for nothing. See, because when I came back from Iraq, okay, I got divorced. I wasn't the only one that ever got divorced. I was married for 28 years to three women. So, you know, 10, 10, and now I'm on eight. And we, we said, we ain't going to judge me. I'm not licensed. I'm what? Medicated. But no, y'all, I went to the courthouse. And the judge told me, Mr. Hines, you have to pay child support. I said, excuse me, excuse me, Your Honor. What is child support? I'm with these children all the time. I'm supporting them. He said, you're going to have to pay child support. I said, okay, no problem. He said, Mr. Hines, your child support is $1,500. I said, excuse me, Your Honor, these ain't Tiger Woods kids. <laughs> I said, who is the uncircumcised Philistine in the back that's adding this up? I said, God only asked for 10%. How come she get 30? I said, excuse me, Honor. I got a little spiritual. I said, Your Honor, I was watching TBN the other night. Little white lady named Sally Struthers, she said, for a dollar, you can feed a child for a month. That's the child I want. You can keep this little $1,500 child. Boy, with that dollar child, I brushed the flies off his mouth. Push it on it. I'll write the check right now, $12 for the whole year. <laughs> With dreams of flying, she grew up in Annapolis, not far from the gates of the Naval Academy, and became the Navy's first African-American female Naval Flight Officer. Correspondent James Crawford has this interview with Matisse Wright. Tell us about your childhood in Annapolis and the impact that had in influencing you to join the military. I was very fortunate. My, my parents had a house that was just about a mile and a half from the Naval Academy. And uh, we did a lot of events. We'd go to football games at the stadium, or we'd go to track meets, or go hear a speaker, or uh, go to different events. If there was a play or something, the midshipmen were performing. Um, go watch the sailboat races. Lots of events at the Naval Academy uh, were attended by me and my, my sisters and brothers. Um, and uh, so, so I was indoctrinated very early, uh, just because of geography, I guess. Uh, but, but we also used to sponsor midshipmen. My family used to sponsor mids. And so when I was a little girl, there were always midshipmen either at my mom's house or at my cousin's houses or wherever. Uh, so talking to them was easy to do and uh, to learn what they were going to be doing, which is serving in the Navy. Uh, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was very interested in kind of following the paths that many of them had shared with me. Uh, to either fly an airplane or drive a ship or, you know, do support in some way, uh, be on a submarine, which was not permissible for women at the time. It, it is today, I'm happy to say. Uh, all of those things were very intriguing to me, especially the flying part. You are very well known for your background in, in naval flight. Do you still feel like you're still flying sometimes? So my background in the Navy, I've been very fortunate. Um, I am the Navy's first African-American Naval Flight Officer female. And uh, certainly when I was in flight school, I didn't, I wasn't trying to become that, but it was a title. And, and it's, uh, when I first learned that no other African-American woman had done what I was trying to do, I first thought, wow, that's unfortunate because that's an entire uh, group of people that have not been able to contribute to a very reputable uh, career path. And, and so I was honored to, to, to recognize that I was going to be the first, but then I thought, well, you know, there's nothing that I'm doing that's so brilliant that no one like me should have ever had uh, the opportunity to do. But the key thing there is, is being given the opportunity, and the Naval Academy prepared me well so that when I got to flight school, I was able to complete the curriculum and earn my wings as a Naval Flight Officer. It is a bit of a famous role that I have in the Navy as a first. Um, and uh, hopefully when a, a young lady, maybe a six-year-old, looks at me and, and, and has a desire to fly one day, 
they can, she can kind of say, well, she did it, so I can do it too. I, I wasn't uh, privy to that, um, but that didn't stop me. I mean, I, I wanted to fly, and it didn't really, it didn't come to my conscience that, hey, no one that looked like me had ever done it before. Uh, so I just put my head down and, and uh, really worked hard, and it was not easy. Um, even though I had the great preparation of very high-level math science at the Naval Academy when I got to flight school, it's still very difficult. Um, but it was well worth it, and there is nothing like flying. I mean, uh, I've had the pleasure of serving uh, in the private sector for 20-plus years, and uh, there's just no equivalent thing to flying. But there have also been some very op uh, great opportunities that I've had in the private sector um, that I just couldn't have gotten if I were still in uniform. So it all balances out in the end. Can you tell us something about your own transition uh, from the military world into the civilian world? What was that like? One of the things I remember very vividly when I first, uh, my first day at work, which was for a company called SRA, uh, so they had hired me, had gone through the ap uh, application and interview process, and I literally, my first day of work was in the elevator with the CEO of the company. Didn't know that because, you know, on active duty, when you're in the presence of your leadership, you can look over and see, oh, that guy has stars, I don't, he's senior, I'm not. Uh, but with the CEO, he was in a business suit, I was in a business suit, so literally we get in the elevator, he's going to one floor, I'm going to another, so you say good morning. Um, and it was very, uh, very unhierarchical, or, or you know, there just wasn't the hierarchy or structure that I experienced in the military. So that was a bit of a transition. Um, and one of the other things that I found to be kind of interesting uh, with my transition was, in the military you had a, a specific role. When I was the navigator in my aircraft, I had a specific thing that I was responsible for doing. In the private sector as a businesswoman, you can kind of be creative. You can go beyond the, the scope of work that you're assigned to do, um, and that's embraced. It's basically whoever's in the conference room or in the meeting room who has an answer can raise their hand and give it, and uh, that's well received. Uh, in the military, there were some instances where that was not always welcome. You know, when you're the lieutenant, you're not supposed to say things in the presence of the general in some instances. So. The rigor and the, the constraints in the military, um, I found uh, when I went to the private sector, they just weren't as, as, as visible. You have talked often in the past about the importance of STEM, okay? Can you, can you just tell us and why is this so important for careers in the workforce today? I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, I don't think you can walk up to a, any person in any environment and not find at least, if there are 10 people, you're probably going to see at least 10 cell phones in their pockets or a laptop in their bag or a iPad somewhere. Uh, so the technology is now on us, right? I mean, we literally carry it in our pocket almost everywhere we go. And if you get in your car and you're headed to work and you've forgotten your cell phone, nine times out of 10, you're going to turn back around and go back and get it. So, so science, technology, engineering, and math is very much a part of our everyday lives today. Uh, now that computers are very much in our lives, um, understanding how they work or how they don't work or what we want to do with them or not do with them, I think is even more important than in the generation when I was in high school. When I was in high school, computer science was a thing to do, but it wasn't the thing to do. I think now, uh, as a nation, the more kids and, and young people that we can get studying in, in STEM, uh, I just think our nation is going to be better. From the Internet of Things, which, um, like I was talking to a colleague the other day who just literally changed the thermostats in their house to these Internet-driven thermostats. They're called Nest is the product that he was using. Um, and, and so to understand how to control that with your phone when you're at work so that when you get home, the temperature in your house is correct, you kind of, you know, understanding the science behind that and what's happening when you dial into the internet on your phone to make the change of your thermostat at your house, um, much of what we will do today and tomorrow and into the future is going to be somehow related to science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, so, so that's why one of the things I frequently will tell young people that are elementary school or college uh, age is to study in the, in the harder science technology areas because I think that, uh, first of all, I think our nation needs it. 
um, because uh, there's just not enough of us. Uh, when we look at the competitive landscape of, of who our peers and adversaries are, are across the, the globe, uh, the more students that we can have who understand STEM, uh, I think the better off our nation will be. That's all for this edition of Veterans in Transition. We ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you have a story to tell, reach out to us at vetsintransition.com. And remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time. But then the Lord fit for the kids to come and live with me six years ago. So my wife at the time wasn't feeling it. She said, babe, I only signed up for the every other weekend. I don't know if I can do this all the time. I said, listen, babe, I got that. I said, but if the children come back and live with us, that $1,500 come back in the house. She said, I heard the Lord say, let's raise these kids. I ain't saying she a gold digger. But y'all know the rest of that song. So I had this bright idea. I said, I'm on my third marriage. First two didn't work out. This one got to work out. So I had this awesome idea that I'm going to do something to help this marriage work. I didn't go to no counseling. I didn't go to no pastor. I moved my mother-in-law in. <laughs>